Hello, this is Dr. João Flávio Nogueira, and it's a great honor and great pressure to me to moderate this session, Endoscopic Ear Surgery Tips and Perils. This has been a very successful session. We have been doing this since 2008, I think, or 2007. And uh, we are going to try to talk, to discuss with uh, some experts in the field, uh, the tips and the pearls after so many years of doing endoscopic ear surgery that we can try to uh, teach and to show to you all. But with this uh, recording presentation, I think uh, you will have a very great experience on endoscopic ear surgery. So uh, it's my honor to moderate this session. It's a session with uh, three giants and three uh, number tens uh, on endoscopic ear surgery. Uh, Dr. Daniel, Daniel Lee, uh, we, he is Associate Professor of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at Harvard Medical School and Director of Pediatric Otology and Neurotology at Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, Dr. Muaz Tarabishi, which is the co-founder of the Tarabishi Stumberger Ear and Sinus Institute. And also he is uh, part of the International Advisory Board of the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. And Daniel Marchioni, which is professor and head of the ENT department of the Verona University in Verona, northern part of Italy. So uh, since I presented uh, number 10s in soccer, the number 10 is the best player. So we have three number 10s here, like uh, Messi, uh, Maradona, Pelé. And uh, we are going now to show, and this is going to be my presentation, the 10 tips that I think uh, are very important for endoscopic ear surgery at this time. So I have nothing to disclose, okay? There were some game changers in our specialty. Microscope was one of them, uh, the cochlear implantation, uh, 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 the drills, and endoscopes, for instance, was, uh, they were a very big game changer, especially for rhinology and now for otology at the last 10 years. But of course, we have to, to combine the instruments and you have to understand how to use the instruments, endoscope, microscope, or cochlear implant or drills, and to try to use the instrument when it's best for the patient or best for the case. And uh, it's the tip number one that I have. It's not a fight between endoscope and microscope. It's rather a, an, an addition, another tool that you have that can be very useful, especially when you're dealing with middle ear disease uh, when compared to the traditional microscopic techniques. And Socrates, the Greek philosopher, he had a very interesting phrase. He said, the secret of change is not to focus all of our energy, uh, but not to fight with the old, but to build the new. And we are trying in the last 10 years or 10 or 15 years or so to build new concepts, new things, and this uh, hopefully is working uh, because many, many people throughout the world is using the endoscopes nowadays. So re, uh, remind it's not a fight. We are sur surgeons. We are not surgeons of a tool. We are surgeons of uh, the ear, okay? The same thing happened in sinus surgery. As we can see here, microscopic sinus surgery. And nowadays uh, with the combined approach and nowadays with the endoscopic uh, sinus surgery. No, no one says anymore endoscopic sinus surgery. Everyone says sinus surgery. If you use an endoscope or if you use a, a microscope, whatever, it's going to be a sinus surgery. And uh, the evolution of, of sinus surgery was uh, important and mainly because of, of histories like this, anecdotal histories like this, but they were true at the time that people could smoke at the OR and uh, because they could smoke, you could see the ashes on the mucosa of the nasal cavity and the ashes moving on this mucosa, and then they could find the mucociliar clearance. So it's very interesting that uh, people used to smoke at the ORs at the time. And nowadays we can see this with endoscopes. And the tip number two is try to understand the physiology of the disease of the ear, because we have also mucociliar clearance at the ear mucosa. So it's very important to try to understand this and to try to understand the principles, the principles of ventilation, the principles of function, uh, uh, the reason that we have mastoid or the reason that we have middle ear, the reason that we have eustachian tube. I always talk about this during the lecture. So this is uh, uh, our tip number two. And to understand also the concepts of the 
uh, a tympanic diaphragm, which is not new. These concepts, they are not new. But uh, with microscope, it's very difficult to see them. With the endoscope, it's more easy to understand and to understand the concepts of ventilations. This is the most anterior part, posterior, superior, and inferior. And this more thick arrow here uh, represents the most important ventilation pathway between the station tube, the middle ear, and the mastoid antrum. And it passes through a region that we call the tympanic isthmus. And that will be tip number three, to understand what is the tympanic isthmus, both anatomically and physiologically. The tympanic isthmus is an anatomic region between the cochlear form process and the ecodusapigial joint. It's the most important uh, pathway for the most important ventilation uh, route uh, between the eustachian tube, uh, middle ear, and mastoid. So whenever the tympanic isthmus is closed, uh, you will probably have some problems with the ear, either a retraction or either a perforation, either at atelectatic at tympanic membrane. And as we can see here in this view, this is a very odd view because this is superior, this is lateral, and this is medial. This is the a long process of the incus, this is the stapes. This is the tympanic isthmus, which is very small. And every any edema, small edema or fibrotic tissue after an otitis, acute otitis media, or uh, uh, anything that can close here, this very small hole. And if you close this very small hole, you can have problems of ventilations, of pressure changes. Uh, in the middle ear and then in the mastoid. And as we can see here, we see the three ventilation pathways. This is the region of the tensor fold. This is the cochlear form process. This is the tensor tendon uh, muscle here, malleus, incus, stapes, facial nerve is going to be in this direction. This is the most important ventilation pathway passing through the tympanic isthmus. This, this anterior ventilation pathway passing through the tensor fold is closed most of the time, 80% of the time is closed. And the posterior ventilation route is between the incudistopedia joint and the facial recesses, which is going to be this direction. So this is tip number three to understand that uh, our ventilation routes, it's a small corridor and any edema, any fibrotic tissue, uh, anything can close uh, this uh, tympanic isthmus, and then you can have pressure changes, and then, then you can have problems. This is an example of a tymp uh, tympanic perforation. And then we always try to check the tympanic isthmus, even in perforations that are dry, like this. So we uh, refresh the borders of the perforations, create the tympanomato flap, enter the middle ear, aspirate a little bit. Whenever we aspirate, sometimes we open the, the isthmus and there will be secretions from the mastoid. And here you see the problem. The isthmus is not completely closed, but it is a little bit closed because you have a medialization of the malleus. This is the tensor tympanic canal, Jacobson nerve, the region of the station tube, we can inspect and we can see the carotid artery, the supratubal recess. And then we can see if there are any blockages here. We can see the round window niche, the oval window niche, uh, the facial nerve, the tympanic segment of facial nerve, ponticulus, subiculum, sinus, tympani. Note that I did not curate anything. And now we are going to open the isthmus, the tympanic isthmus, using curved instruments and curating a little bit to do a small articotomy to open. And then I always like to wash. This is a very important tip to wash the mastoid antrum. You can wash with a saline solution, you can wash with a steroid solution, or you can wash with antibiotic solution also. And sometimes there will be secretions from the mastoid that are going to come out from uh, this wash. And then at the end, we keep up the isthmus open and then put a cartilage. And why I prefer to use cartilage to reconstruct the tympanic membrane? Because using cartilage is easier uh, with endoscopic uh, ear surgery. And second, you use less gel form. And gel form also can provoke a, an inflammatory response and a fibrotic response that can have a scar tissue in, into those ventilation routes that we have between the eustachian tube and then the mastoid. Another example is like this, uh, another tympanic perforation that we can also inspect uh, the tympanic isthmus. In some per uh, tympanic perforations, the tympanic isthmus is going to be completely fine. So you wouldn't need uh, to, to deglove the malleus like we do like this, the tympanic membrane, uh, tympanomato flap from the malleus. Here, the tympanic isthmus is completely open, can you see? But in some cases, it, it's not. And the, the, the way that I have to check the tympanic isthmus is raising the tympanomato flap, including degloving all the malleus. But 
even though we open, we try to open the tensor fold, the region of the tensor fold, see? We see the tip of the instrument here. And then once we open the tensor fold, we create another ventilation route uh, from the eustachian tube to the, uh, to the mastoid antrum. Tip number four, it's all an, about anatomy. So uh, endoscopic uh, ear surgery has allows us to understand the anatomy in a way that it, it was very difficult before with the microscope. So to see the ponticulus, the subiculum, which is here, the finiculus, this is a left ear, by the way, superior, inferior, anterior, and posterior, sinus tympani, sinus subtympanicum. So it's very important to see the anatomy in a way like this. And also some, some tips, some, some points like the malleus cap, see? The malleus cap is this uh, small piece of bone here that provides a very nice dissection plane to elevate the tympanum of flap from the malleus and to the glove completely the malleus uh, without uh, many problems. So it's very in interesting. And uh, also uh, in this case here, you have a very great exposure. And tip number five is, is exposure, middle ear exposure is the key. So you are working in the middle ear in a transcanal fashion most of the times when you are not doing a combined approach. So if you expose things, it's going to be easy for you to understand. So we elevate, we see the malleus cap again. Uh, see here the, the malleus cap, and then we elevate the malleus cap. And then we can have a very nice dissection plane to elevate uh, uh, the tympanic uh, metal flap to the glove completely the malleus. So it's a very nice way to, to the glove the malleus. And then you can see, you can understand the anatomy that you have uh, in the middle ear uh, in this region. Look, I did not curate anything, I just the glove the malleus. And we can see a very nice anatomy here of the middle ear, the malleus. We can see uh, the, the incas, we can see also the stapes. We can see uh, the region of the sinus tympani. We can see round window niche. We can see sinus subtympanic, the region of the sinus tympanic facial nerve, and lots of other anatomical landmarks that we can understand only using the endoscope. This is a zero degree endoscope, by the way, and we can check three millimeter endoscope, zero degree, and we can check the anatomy, the most anterior part of the protympanic space, the proteiniculus, the carotid artery, supratubal recess. So it's a very nice way, tip number five, to expose. Middle ear exposure is key. And the glove in the malleus, it's very important to do this exposure. Tip number uh, six is always start at the middle ear. Even if you have a bicholisatoma, you always start at the middle ear. Uh, you clean the middle ear first, and then if you need, you go to the mastoid. This will save you from some mastoidectomies because even when you have cholesteatoma, sometimes you ask the CT scan and the mastoid is completely gray, but it's not cholesteatoma inside the mastoid. It's only granulation tissue or only secretions inside the mastoid. So if you start the surgery in the middle ear and if you need to go to the mastoid, you go to the mastoid, you will save, first of all, some patients from mastoidectomies. And second of all, you save time because you clean the most difficult part first which is the middle ear. To do a mastoidectomy is not that, that difficult. To open the antrum is not that difficult, but to clean the sinus tympani, clean the facial recess, clean the protympanic space, this can be more difficult. And if you do this at the end when you are tired, sometimes you can leave disease behind. So we always try to, to clean first the middle ear. So we see here the middle ear, this cholesteatoma has already eroded most of the ossicular chain. And then we try to have a dissection plane from the cholesteatoma. Sometimes you can get a very nice dissection plane, sometimes you cannot. Uh, you can use curved instruments to try to, to remove the cholesteatoma. You can wash inside to see if the cholesteatoma can come out, but you clean the sinus tympani. You clean the facial recess, you clean the oval window niche, remove all the skin. And then you see oh, sinus tympani, sinus subtympanicum, oval window niche, facial recess here. And then you go to the mastoid with a microscope or with an exoscope, or even with an endoscope, if you want to do the mastoidectomy to do a combined approach, what we call the combined approach. And after you can also use the endoscope through a transmastoid corridor in order to work better with uh, those instruments. So this is tip number six. Tip number seven is to have instruments. You cannot do a frontal sinus surgery, endoscopic frontal sinus surgery with a septoplasty instruments. You need to have, if you want to do cholesteatoma, if you want to do more complete endoscopic surgery, you need to have curved instruments. 
So this is very key. This is very important. And my must-have instruments are a few. You don't need to have a completely tray of curved instruments, but you need to have like a Thomasson dissector. You need to have like a curved uh, uh, scissor, a very good curette for me is very important. So uh, very few, four or five instruments and curved sections. This is very important are important for uh, doing endoscopic cholestatoma surgery, for instance. And the tip number eight is like this. Num uh, don't worry about the combined approach. In the past, we tried to do everything transcanal, but nowadays it's easier to do the things that you need to do transcanal in the middle year. And then if you need to go to the mastoid, you do a combined approach. So this is uh, very interesting uh, in order to perform safe and effective uh, surgeries. And when you do a combined approach, it's interesting because you can also use the endoscopes inside the muscle. This is the middle ear, by the way. We're cleaning the cholesteratoma, uh, removing the head of the malleus. This is a left ear. And then uh, after we do this, we completely clean this. We inspect. We can inspect and see here the region of the tensile fold. This is the cochlear form process. And this is the region of the tensile fold. We are opening the tensile fold here uh, using uh, uh, like a transmastoid corridor to open this tensile fold and to have this very uh, nice view. But also you can uh, do mastoidectomies with the endoscope, of course, to reach the antrum, you use your eyes, you don't need a microscope. And once you reach the antrum, you can use the endoscope to do a, uh, an endoscopic mastoidectomy. Of course, you only have one hand, you have to have a very good assistance to, to wash uh, the things for you. In this case, we are trying to wash in a transcanal fashion still the cholesteatoma, but there was cholesteatoma inside the mastoid. So we do a combined approach. The cholesteatoma didn't come out. We see the sinus tympana in the middle ear, it's clean. And then we do a mastoidectomy. And after we do the mastoidectomy, we see here the sac, the end of the sac of the cholesteatoma sometimes. And then we can push, we can put some cotonoids and push this cholesteatoma. This is the lateral canal. We can push this cholesteatoma to the middle ear and then remove the cholesteatoma from the middle ear using the endoscopes, of course, and doing this combined approach, endoscopic and transcanal and uh, transmastoid uh, technique. So this is transmastoid. We see there's still some cholesteatoma here. This is the region of the adidus adantrum. We can use burrs here with the endoscope. This uh, scutum, the medium part of the scutum, is a blind spot for endoscopic air surgery. You cannot see, even with a 70 degrees endoscope. So if you have doubt this part here, if you have doubt that you have cholesteatoma here, you, you must have, uh, you must do a combined approach and uh, use some curved instruments to clean this medial part of the scutum. This is the lateral canal. This is the dura, middle fossa dura, and this is the middle ear here. And then at the end, it's nice because when you do a combined approach, you can also inspect the reconstruction that you do, the cartilage that you put. And you can see after you put the cartilage, you can see the ventilation pathways. So we are now putting the cartilage to reconstruct the tympanic membrane. And then we put the cartilage like this, we put the tympanometal flap, and then we go transmastoid. And then we can see a uh, transmastoid with the endoscope. This is a 30 degree endoscope to see the position of the cartilage, to see if the cartilage is touching uh, the stapes, if there is a remaining stapes, and to see the station tube here opening. So you can see the stapes is here, cochlear from process, the cartilage is not touching the stapes, so probably you need to do a reconstruction here. And then the station tube is here. So you can see the, the ventilation pathways in real time uh, during this uh, combined approach because we have instruments limitation. The medial part of the scutum is a limit uh, for ourselves. Uh, and tip number eight, endoscopes and cameras. Six centimeters endoscopes are not suitable for endoscopic case surgery. You should use three millimeter, four millimeter, four, uh, four, three millimeter, 14 centimeter, or four millimeter, 18 centimeter. They're sinoscopes, traditional sinoscopes that you have. Zero, very nice. 30, very nice. 45, nice. And 70, just for, for very few cases. So if you have money just to buy one endoscope, buy the 30 degree endoscope. If you have money to buy two, buy the zero and 45. So this, is going, this combination is going to be very useful for you in most of the cases. Uh, cameras are, not, are very important. A 3CCD camera is essential. You don't need to have an HD camera, but it must has a three, have a 3CCD uh, camera head. 3D endoscopes may be interesting for the future, but for this time, you don't need because with the movement with your hands, you generate a 3D uh, in your head. 
Tip number nine, patient position in anesthesia. This is very important. TV anesthesia tends to reduce the bleeding. So whenever you can, you can ask the anesthesiologist to perform TIVA. And also, this is the position that uh, we try to work in the operating room. And this is the position of the patient. We try to hyperextend the head and elevate the dorsum, uh, like in, in endoscopic sinus surgery. Because doing this, you can increase the venous return up to 30% and re potentially reduce the bleeding of the patient, the intraoperative bleeding. Also, to cut the hairs before you do the procedures is very important to put adrenaline soaked cottonoids like this in the ear canal while you're cutting like one minute, two minutes, because it, it provides a very nice vasoconstriction and you can have potentially less bleeding also when you are elevating the tympanomatal flap. Remember, the tympanomatal flap is the most difficult part of the surgery. So if you can pass this part, it's going to be nice for you. And number 10, the last tip, take your time. Don't rush into things. Don't worry about bleeding. Always put a cottonoid, a pledget with adrenaline. Always wash with saline solutions. And first, and most important, don't try to perform the same cases you are used to perform with the microscope at your first endoscopic ear surgery. Because otherwise, it's very difficult to, to, to achieve this goal, to try to do the same. If you've never had, held an endoscope before in your life, it's very difficult to perform the same surgeries that you perform with a microscope, with the endoscope at your first case. There is a learning curve. And this learning curve of the microscope that you might already have been through uh, uh, brought you to many good places in ear surgery. But the learning curve of the endoscopes sometimes are very difficult and sometimes it's very hard to, to achieve the same things that you achieve with the microscope. To have the proficiency in this, you take like time, one year, like 20 cases, 50 cases, I don't know. And uh, the most, the most uh, common mistake I see sometimes is like this. A guy takes a course, a very important guy takes a course, is very good with microscopic ear surgery, and he wants to perform in his first surgery the same things that he performs with the microscope. This is going to be import, uh, impossible, and it's easier to blame the endoscope than to blame uh, yourself. Endoscopic ear surgery has a lot of benefits and a lot of advantages, but don't confuse it as being easy. This is a phrase of uh, my friend, Dr. Philip Litterfield, and he gave in one of the Harvard courses, endoscopic ear surgery courses. So this was my lecture and my message to you. Try to follow these 10 tips, and I think you're going to be fine. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you soon, uh, maybe next year, presentially, after the uh, pandemic, the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Good afternoon from Boston, Massachusetts. My name is Daniel Lee. I'm a neurotologist here at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. Uh, thrilled to be part of this panel discussion on endoscopic ear surgery tips and pearls. Thank you to the Academy uh, for this opportunity, and thank you to our moderator, John Flavio Nogura and to our co-panelists, Moaz Cherubishi and Daniela Marchioni for helping to share the stage and to help discuss tips and pearls on endoscopic ear surgery and to share uh, their wisdom. I'm very honored to be part of this distinguished uh, group of speakers today. The title of my presentation, of course, will be Endoscopic Ear Surgery Tips and Pearls uh, from the perspective of having been performing endoscopic ear surgery now for really almost a decade or so here in Boston. These are my financial disclosures of which one, 3NT Medical is a company that produces a technology that is sold in the United States and FDA approved for use in endoscopic ear surgery. I will be referring to this technology very generically, I will not be mentioning any brand names or logos. And so first to clarify terminology, if otoendoscopy is the use of rigid endoscopes to examine the ear, endoscopic ear surgery is the use of rigid endoscopes to actually perform ear surgery. Transcanal endoscopic ear surgery is when we leverage the form factor of these small telescopes and use the external auditory canal as our primary surgical corridor. Transmastoid endoscopic ear surgery is when we use a telescope through the mastoid canal up through the antrum and additus at antrum to be able to access the epitympanic spaces and to be able to look down towards the mesotympanum. And so the mastoid corridor is a really great way to be able to access chronic ear disease that you cannot see or reach 
through a transcanal approach, even with a generous atechotomy. And so heads-up surgery is really a category of surgical approaches in which the surgeon's head is positioned up and looking forward. So whether that's laparoscopic cholecystectomy surgery or endoscopic sinus surgery, in this case, we're talking about endoscopic ear surgery. A new class of technologies for otology include exoscopes or digital microscopes. These are also examples of heads-up procedures in which you're not having to look down through oculars and then having to negotiate the stack height and um, struggle with the ergonomics of that configuration. And so why did I switch uh, to the endoscope for middle ear surgery in my practice? Well, the view is just vastly superior. And so this is an example of a case for my practice, a right ear at full zoom using a traditional binocular microscope and speculum. And so we can see the anatomy of the right middle ear superior, inferior, anterior, posterior, showing the corda tympani nerve, the eroded long process of incus, and the stapes superstructure, and the cochlea. I then removed the speculum and brought in my Hopkins rod telescope, and boom, we have an amazing wide field view of the same anatomical structures. Yes, the diagnosis is still made, and yes, the um, procedure can proceed whether one uses a telescope or a microscope. However, the view that you get is just vastly superior to be able to appreciate not only the eroded along process of incus, but the body of the incus, the chorda tympani nerve, the cochleiform process, facial nerve, cochlea, the entire stapes superstructure, the tendon of the stapes, and now we're seeing even the round window niche and the subcochlear canaliculus, all by just introducing a zero degree telescope. No additional bony or soft tissue dissection required. This is another case from my practice, a left ear transcanal tympanotomy showing superior, inferior, anterior, and posterior, the incus, tympanic facial nerve, the stapedial tendon, and the elusive ponticulus, which in Latin means little bridge, the bridge of bone between the pyramid and the promontory of the cochlea, and our sinus tympani, the area of the retrotopanic recess, which oftentimes can harbor chronic ear disease. Another case, left ear transcanal tympanotomy in a patient with left-sided conductive hearing loss, showing superior, inferior, anterior, posterior, stapedial tendon, facial nerve, incus, malleus undersurface, tympanic membrane, the funiculus, the subcochlear canaliculus, which when dissected can lead to the petrous apex if you can navigate the jugular bulb and the carotid artery, the fustus, which is coplanar with the floor of the scala tympani, a great landmark for cochlear implant surgeons, the subiculum and particulus, which help to define boundaries of the sinus tympani. Left ear transcanal tympanotomy looking now superior and anterior, showing your cochleiform process, the tensor tympani tendon, the cog, which separates the anterior attic from the supratubal recess. Looking now down in this case, posterior inferior, showing your sinus tympani again, your ponticulus, and your subiculum. Looking more inferior anterior, showing your round window niche, your fustus, and your funiculus. A view that you oftentimes do not get during a transcanal approach, unless you remove a lot of soft tissue and bone, is this of the protopanic space and beyond, showing the eustachian tube orifice, the internal carotid artery, the cochlea, and the semi canal of the tensor tympani muscle. This is an 11-year-old male patient with left-sided chronic protitis media history, showing on the left uh, the autoendoscopic uh, examination with a large polyp and inflammatory disease. CT scan, coronal series, left ear showing an opacity in the middle ear and mastoid, which appears to be contiguous, associated with some bony erosion, likely in a, an erosive extensive cholesteatoma with, uh, you can see, scutal blunting. 
So what's the role of transmastoid endoscopy or surgery? We, we focus so much on transcanal approaches. Well, this is a great way to leverage, again, the benefits of the telescope transmastoid without having to potentially sacrifice the ear canal to look around the corners in extensive chronic ear cases. And so after placing the telescope and resting it on a moist gauze pad to stabilize it on the mastoid cavity wall, we then can introduce an angled telescope and look beautifully into the attic, appreciating the surfaces of the middle ear that you cannot see with a transcanal approach to be able to ensure that you've uh, not left behind any residual disease. And take you through this anatomy again, transmastoid with an angled scope looking down into the middle ear as shown here. So this will be uh, antero superior, postero inferior, lateral, and medial, showing the malleus undersurface, the stapy superstructure, the tympanic membrane, and the chorded tympany nerve. Cog and cochleiform process. Another case, a left-sided transmastoid view of the middle ear, again, looking, hovering in the epitympanic space, looking down, showing the stapy superstructure, the cochleiform process, the tensor tympany tendon, and again, the cog. And so I believe that transmastoid endoscopy approaches really helps to reduce the need for canal wall down mastoidectomies in those cases of extensive cholesteatomas. So use the endoscope, and this is a great way for you microscopic surgeons out there to get started with endoscopic ear techniques through the mastoid. The tips and pearls, does it matter which ear I start with when doing endoscopic ear surgery? Absolutely, yes. Left ears unquestionably are easier for right-handed surgeons. You're holding the endoscope with your left hand, you're obviously dissecting with your dominant right hand. And so when you're just getting started, please start with the left ear if possible. You'll find this to be much easier and less frustrating when getting started. So again, um, for left ears, you're holding the endoscope clearly with your left hand and you're dissecting with your right hand as shown by Reagan Burmark, one of our former residents and fellows here in Boston, now a Harvard rhinologist. The right ear is easier for the left-handed surgeon. So if you're a southpaw, a left-handed surgeon, please start with the right ear. This will be easier when getting started with a transcanal endoscopic ear procedure. What about OR setup? Well, there are many ways you can lay out your operating room. However, the most important condition that needs to be met, no matter how you arrange the rest of the operating room, is the HD or 4K monitor or whatever monitor you're using must be as close to eye level as possible. Anything less than this is suboptimal, especially when getting started. You don't want to struggle with a new technique when your video monitor is to your left or to your right because the staff tells you you can't put the video monitor directly in front of you because it's just too cluttered. If you can't figure it out, do not get started with endoscopic ear surgery. What's the ideal endoscopic system for ear surgery? Well, most of us use these Hopkins rod telescopes that are coupled to either a 2D HD or 4K, three CCD camera. Most are three millimeter by 14 centimeter in length. Uh, if you were to quarry endoscopic or surgeons globally, some patients' um, ear canals can accommodate larger scopes. And so if you're just getting started and you have primarily an adult practice, a four millimeter by 18 centimeter rhinology scope is also a reasonable way to get started and you can use your own traditional otological instrumentations instrumentation sets. Short scopes are not helpful for endoscopic ear surgery, so do not use these for actually doing procedures. They're actually great, obviously, for otoendoscopy, either in the operating room or the office. So anything less than 14 centimeters long is too short for endoscopic ear surgery because the camera is just too bulky. You need more volume of space around the ear to work. So camera head that's needed if you're using a Hopkins rod telescope, HD versus 4K, I don't think it really makes a difference. The HD is just fine. And just make sure that you have a three CCD camera. A three chip camera is essential. Anything less than that when using a Hopkins rod telescope is not adequate for endoscopic ear surgery. What about doing endoscopic ear surgery with two hands? People are always complaining. I, I wish I had my second hand for the suction to clear the secretions when doing dissection. Is there a way forward? And maybe there is. Um, 
recently approved as a single use rigid distal chip endoscopic system for middle ear surgery. It's disposable, has a very lightweight form factor, and what's really nice is it has a built-in 2.2 millimeter diameter distal chip scope with a three French suction. So the scope pan also contains a three French suction which you can maneuver with your thumb actuator. Thank you to Dr. Dan Chu at Cincinnati Children's for providing this footage showing a beautiful dissection of a transcanal tip anatomy in a child using a distal chip system, which has a built-in suction, which you can see is helping to clear the secretions simultaneous to elevating the flap. And I think this is a great way to get started, especially if you're new to the field, to be able to reduce the frustration, clear the suction, the um, clear the secretions with your built-in suction and get that flap up successfully. How do I optimize my workstation? And so there are many ways to do this, but this is how we like to do it in Boston. So a saline soaked microwipe, a defog patty, a tragal hook, which helps to retract the tragus forward to clear the meatus more easily with your telescope, and a cup of saline. Together, these things really help to make it easier to clear your instrumentation, to clean your uh, Hopkins rod telescope, and to do ear surgery. Don't chase around a moist gauze around the surgical field. Keep it contained in a cup lid. It keeps it moist, it keeps it in one place, and you will clear this telescope like a thousand times during a procedure. So make it easy, make it ergonomic, optimize your workstation. Trimming the hairs is extremely important. Even that single hair can smudge the scope repeatedly. Take the time, we use an iris scissors to trim the hairs before beginning your trans canal procedure. Positioning of the patient, reverse trend on absolutely important to reduce bleeding during endoscopic surgery. Thank you, Joao Flavio, for this very important tip. Vasoconstriction, clearly important. And I use, like we all use, some sort of epinephrine solution to help vasoconstrict the external auditory canal skin. I use one to 100,000 epinephrine with a 27 gauge needle to get and achieve a good blanch, as shown here. Um, using cotton balls, cottonoids, or unwoven surgisol balls that I like to call surgisnail that are soaked in one to 1,000 epinephrine are essential during flap elevation. You need to have something physically absorbing secretions during elevation to reduce frustration and ease elevation and soft tissue dissection. Anesthetic consideration, considerations are very, very important. And so none of these things make any difference at all if you don't have this conversation with anesthesia to tell that person, we need to achieve, if possible, safe hypotension. The 80s to 90 systolic is key. Anything higher than that and your ear will ooze and nothing can stop that. And I've learned that inhalation agents can provide more stable hypotension than TIVA. So TIVA obviously is a really great way to administer anesthesia, especially in the ambulatory setting. Um, however, um, it sometimes it's difficult to maintain a stable degree of hypotension. And so um, if you have a challenging case and you had to choose, I would favor inhalation agents rather than TIVA. And finally, are suction dissectors needed in endoscopic ear surgery? I believe, yes. I think it's, these really help to reduce the frustration levels when elevating a flap um, trans canal and can help to clear the secretions. And in this case, this is a resident for the first time elevating a flap in, uh, during his otology rotation. And he was able to do this very quickly with a suction elevator to complete the tapanomedal flap elevation. So to conclude, please keep an open mind. Uh, take a hands-on endoscopic ear surgery course if they are available in 2022. And we all hope that things improve next year. Start slowly, but don't waste time struggling in difficult cases. Switch back to the microscope quickly. Do not struggle at the beginning because patient care clearly always comes first. And finally, have fun. This is a challenging, but really amazing technique that you can add to your practice to be able to enhance the care of your patients with middle ear and mastoid conditions. And so with that, thank you for your time. And uh, I will turn the virtual microphone over to the rest of the panelists this afternoon. Good morning, and uh, thank you very much to invited me. And today, my topic, uh, it will be endoscopic transcanal uh, transpamotory approach to the internal auditory canal, drawing the step-by-step -step procedure. 
we are speaking about uh, to use uh, external auditory canal as a natural corridor to reach the fundus of the internal auditory canal in order to manage the lesion located in the fundus and in the internal auditory canal until the porous. And this is possible endoscopically, but just in a limited number of patients. And so the indication for the transcanal, transpulmonary endoscopic approach is when the patient has a tumor growing in the internal auditory canal with the tumor size across number one, with the age less than 75 and a localization in the fundus of the internal auditory canal until the porous and with the poor hearing function. Because if we have a normal hearing function, we have to consider to perform a middle cranial fossa in order to try to preserve the hearing. Instead, when you have a poor hearing function, we can adopt the transcanal, transpromontal approach. We can divide the transcanal approaches into kind of approaches, the total endoscopic approach, when the tumor is small and is limited to the internal auditory canal, and the enlarged approach when the tumor is growing just a little bit in the cerebellum pontinangle. We can try to explain the procedure uh, with the drawings and uh, with a step-by-step, -step, you know, of course. We can start with the total endoscopic approach to the internal auditory canal. The indication, again, is when we have a sporadic acoustic tumor, cause number one, or intralabyrinthine tumor invading the vestibule on the cochlea and involving the fundus of the internal auditory canal and the internal auditory canal. We can start the procedure. The first step is to remove and block the skin of the external auditory canal with the eardrum. It's really important to remove and block in order to avoid to leave some fragment of the skin inside the cavity. After this, you can see here, there is the impending cavity after eardrum removal. We needed to drill all the external auditory canal, all the bony wall of the external auditory canal in order to improve our access to the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. This is a, a step is really crucial because you need to remove all the bone until to uncover the temporal mandibular joint here anteriorly. And we have to understand and to see all the attic and all the hypotympanic space. And we have to drill really important drilling in a posterior aspect of the external auditory canal until we can detect the third portions of the facial nerve. When we are performing this drilling, we have to take in mind this kind of drawing. So anteriorly, we have the temporal mandibular joint that we have to check and we have to see, but not to uncover, just to detect. In the superior uh, portion of the dissection, we have the middle kind of fossa, but we needn't to uncover the middle cranial fossa. And we have to drill all the bone, and uh, we have to take in mind that in the posterior aspect, in a deeper pos uh, position of the posterior aspect, there is the third portion of the facial nerve, and we have to detect during the drilling in order to improve our access to the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. Our anterior limit in a deep position is the internal carotid artery and uh, in the lower position is the jugular bulb and uh, superiorly just to uncover the attic. So at the end of, of our drilling we are in this condition uh, we can see here all the tympanic cavity we have to see the third portions of the facial nerve we have to see where is located the internal carotid artery and the jugular bulb, and we have to see all the ossicular chain in the attic. The other step is to remove uh, the ossicular chain. So we have to remove the incus and the malleus, and now we are in this condition. 
removing the malleus, and the incus, we can see better the facial nerve and where it's run the facial nerve over the stapes. And uh, also we can check the condition of the cog and also the cochlariform process. We have to remove the stapes. Removing the stapes, we are entering into the vestibule and you can see here the medial wall of the vestibule and inside the vestibule, there is the spherical recess. You can see here, this is the spherical recess. It's a really important diameter in order to understand where the inferior vestibular nerve is attached. And so is a landmark for the fundus of the internal auditory canal. And you can see the condition after stapes removal. So the facial nerve run over there. The genical ganglia is here between the cog and cochlearyform process. And in the middle wall of the vestibule, there is the spherical recess. After this, we have to remove the promontory region in order to uncover the cochlea. So we can use a drill on a piece of surgery device in order to remove the promontory region. And we have to uncover the basal turn of the cochlea, the middle turn of the cochlea, and the apical turn of the cochlea. So again, now we are in this condition. Anteriorly, there is the internal carotid artery, inferiorly the jugular bulb, posteriorly the third portions of the facial nerve, superiorly the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, the vestibule is here, and this is the spherical recess where is the inferior vestibular nerve is attached, basal, middle, and apical turn of the cochlea. Now, it's really important to consider this kind of anatomy of the cochlea and the vestibule. You can see here the medial wall of the vestibule with the spherical recess, and this is the posterior opening of the posterior canal inside the vestibule and the basal turn of the cochlea with the scala tympani and the scala vestibuli, and the middle turn of the cochlea and the apical turn of the cochlea. Where is the landmark in order to find the fundus of the internal auditory canal? We can see here this bone between the cochlea and the vestibule that we call it the cochlear vestibular bone is the bone that's separating the medial wall or the tympanic cavity from the fundus of the internal auditory canal. So this is a really important landmark, the cochlear vestibular bone. If I remove this bone, I am in this condition. Look, this is a triangle of bone. We have to remove and we are in this condition. We are inside the fundus of the internal auditory canal with the nerves. And this is the projection of the nerves after the cochlear vestibular bone removal. We can see as a first nerves, the cochlear uh, nerves inserting in the cochlea and the inferior vestibular nerve attaching to the spherical recess. And between these nerves more deep, the facial nerve. And so it's really important to consider this drawing as to understand better the projections of the nerve from the external auditory canal to the internal auditory canal. So in order to have an access to the fundus of the internal auditory canal, we have to remove this triangle of bone, the cochlear vestibular bone between the cochlea and the vestibule, this orange area and we can have the fundus of the internal auditory canal with this condition of the nerves. After, when we are able to see the fundus, we can start the drilling or the dura of the internal auditory canal in this way and removing the bone between the internal carotid artery and the anterior aspect of the dura of the internal auditory canal between the third portions of the facial nerve and the posterior aspect of the dura of the internal auditory canal. And this is performing from uh, the superficial area to the deep area in, until the porous. And look now, we are uh, all the internal auditory canal dura until the porous. And uh, we can see here the, the drilling should be performed in this way, removing uh, uh, all the bone in order to uncover the anterior and the posterior aspect of the dura of the internal auditory canal. 
almost all as uh, in the trans labyrinthine approach in order to get this kind of condition, we can open the dura of the internal auditory canal and we can see here the tumor. And after we can dissect the tumor in a really soft way from the nerves in order to remove the tumor from the internal auditory canal from the fundus to the porus. And this is the condition after tumor removal. In this case, the cochlear nerve was sacrificed and we can see here the facial nerve and running inside the internal auditory canal. After we have to close uh, the cavity. In order to close the cavity, we have to perform a closure of the eustachian tube. We can use also a pedicle flap, muscular flap from the tensor tympani muscle, removing the cochlear reform process here, remove and splitting uh, the a muscle of the tympanic cavity and pushing inside the eustachian tube. This is something like a pedicle flap, a muscular flap based on the tensor tympan muscle. And we can use this muscle to push inside the eustachian tube. And we have to close the defect that we are creating in the porus and using a fat pad just to push in a really gently way inside the porus in order to avoid um, to damage the facial nerve. So you need to push in a really gently way in order to stop the leakage and in order to close the defect. And after you can feel the cavity with the fat pad, you can see this is the right way to close with the fat pad in the porus and the fat pad in the cavity and in the external auditory canal. And we can reverse the skin from the cartilage of the external auditory canal in order to close in a blend sac closure fashion the external auditory canal. And this is the last step. Just to show an example and to review uh, all the uh, uh, step-by-step procedure, this is an intralabyrinthine phenomenon. So it's really small, but uh, it's uh, really uh, easy to perform through this canal. And you can see here the drilling of the external auditory canal in order to have a wide access to the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. After ossicular chain removal, you can see the round window here and the fustis bone is over there. We have to remove the promontory region and in order to uncover the cochlea. And we can see here, we have to remove, of course, the stapes, went into the vestibule, and uh, we have to uncover the cochlea. And so now we are in the same condition. We can see the cochlea, the vestibule, and we have to remove the cochlear vestibular bone between the cochlear and the vestibule entering into the fundus of the internal auditory canal, and we can get the tumor inside the fundus of the internal auditory canal. This is the basal term of a cochlea. This is the fundus of the internal auditory canal, median and apical term of a cochlea and the vestibule. And you can see, this is the area of cochlear vestibular bone that we remove. And after we can remove uh, the last piece of the tumor, and you can see uh, the nerves with the projections of the nerve from this point of view. So the first nerve here is a cochlear nerve, the inferior vestibular nerve, and more deep, there is the facial nerve. So it's really important to consider this kind of uh, conformation. When you are able to preserve the cochlear nerve, you are able also to perform uh, a cochlear implant, but we can see again. And this is the closure of the defect, pushing the muscle inside the second tube. And again, and this is the closure of the fundus of the internal auditory canal, pushing the fat inside the fundus here in order to stop the leakage. And after we can fill the cavity with the fat pad, we can detach the skin of the external auditory canal and we can close uh, um, the external auditory canal 
uh, in uh, cul de sac or, or um, fashion. So uh, the, the surgery is finished. I hope you enjoy uh, these lectures and, um, and I would like to thank you very much for your kind invitation. And uh, I hope to see you soon in the next year in the American Academy uh, in person. Thank you very much. This is uh, Moaz Dalbishi from Dubai. And I'm uh, very uh, happy to join uh, Roa and other colleagues in discussing uh, what has really changed in endoscopic ear surgery over the years. Of course, I'm an old timer. I started in uh, 1992. And uh, first, I want to say that I have nothing to declare. Uh, but if you really like try to, to think of what what uh, French canal endoscopic ear surgery means uh, it really means different things to different people and I think it's just a the nature of the development of things uh, that uh, this ends up uh, different people thinking different things about endoscopic ear surgery. I think common classifications uh, is a great one. I think it allows us to communicate. Uh, uh, what we mean uh, by endoscopic ear surgery. Uh, and uh, I just want to say that I started out thinking one way about endoscopic ear surgery and ended up thinking a very different way. So and we used to show these slides. Uh, we used to make the point that uh, it gives us a great access to an area that we all recognize we cannot get access to for sort of private study. We also have this uh, tremendous picture of the uh, middle ear cavity to show the level of access that we have. But I re and we used to talk about uh, really refocusing uh, our attention uh, into the uh, area of the tympanic cavity, uh, which is really the birthplace of cholesterol. Uh, again, I think in 2021, uh, uh, I have. Uh, I'm viewing things in a very different way. Uh, I think we need to relook at the pathology. You know, uh, chronic ear disease uh, basically uh, is a ventilation issue, and the surgery that we usually do is that we just basically fix the battle scar. We try very, very hard to ignore the underlying uh, the pathology, which is a lack of ventilation uh, into the uh, into the ear. And again, we know that uh, the the outcomes in, in chronic ear surgery is really tied up to restoring ventilation uh, into the ear. So basically, you know, for a very, very significant part of my life, i uh, talked about using the endoscope in middle ear surgery. I would say only lately that I have uh, taken into looking at the area of the proteinpanomic or station tube and trying to examine this area with the endoscope. And really, if you use a 30 degree endoscope, you end up with a very terrific view. And you could see that the, uh, this is the area of the proteinpanum uh, or uh, what, what used to be called the volume station tube. And you could see the opening of the uh, cartilaginous or station tube into this area. And this is a uh, 3D reconstruction of the ASL system. This is done uh, by uh, on a Vasalva CT, and uh, this is something that I had maintained a very significant uh, interest in. So Vasalva CT allows you to visualize the whole length of your station tube in a significant chunk of our population. So really, if you think about like what's important in terms of ventilation, of course, the most upstream areas are the most important area and the downstream areas are the least important area. And the problem that we have with our traditional microscopic access is that we have a great access into the mastoid, which is the most downstream uh, area. And we have really almost no access to the uh, important areas such as the protein panel and the eustachian tube. And I think the value of uh, the endoscope is to align the axis that we have with the disease process. And I think we've given so much attention to the mastoids, and I think this attention is undeserved. So also when you start looking with the endoscope, things, uh, even basic definitions of anatomy really changes. Uh, uh, the uh, Eustachius uh, described the Eustachian tube as part bony, part cartilaginous, and this has stood for almost 500 years. And really, 
if you look with an endoscope, the idea of a bony eustachian tube really becomes, uh, sorry to say that, almost ludicrous. Uh, because much of what you see is really the post-symptom. And uh, again, even the opening of the, of the uh, eustachian tube into the nasopharynx looks very much like the opening into the protympanum. And it really is amazing to me, this is of course a histologic slide through the eustachian tube, and it's amazing to me that somebody would decide that uh, this is just part of the eustachian tube, and he calls part of the air cell system, which is uh, of the temporal bone, which is a protympanum, a bony eustachian tube. I think it's very, very counterintuitive. So we had written with other colleagues this editorial calling for correction of this basic anatomic uh, definition. And the eustachian tube, when you view it endoscopically, as you could see here, does not have a bony portion. It's basically just a fibrocartilaginous uh, structure that connects the protympanum into the nasal pharynx. Up by um, quite a few of our colleagues, mostly people who are very interested in endoscopic uh, uh, ear surgery. And the, th the other thing that when I started looking at the protympanum uh, is the area of the obstruction of the ostation tube. This is a long uh, uh, talk, I don't want to get into it, but I really believe that the isthmus, uh, which is in close proximity to the tympanic cavity uh, and is the primary area of interest, uh, I think. Uh, published on this and uh, our myconic ear uh, our, uh, cases and again I think it confirms uh, my suspicion. Uh, but basically what I want to talk about further is what has changed in my practice since 1992. There was really three main items. The first one is that I used to be very much against using a 30 degree endoscope or angled scope. Now I use them very very frequently. Uh, the second thing is that the use of suction instruments, um, and there are multiple sets on the market, and I advise you if you're serious on endoscopic ear surgery to take this seriously. And the last one is the use of retaining suture, which is uh, something that uh, had been also changed and has been now a very consistent part of my practice. Uh, the uh, I just want to talk about the retaining search because I think this is very valuable. You know, when we're doing endoscopic ear surgery, uh, using rigid endoscope, we need to align, uh, one of the main objectives is to align the axis of the bony, bony ear canal with the cartilaginous ear canal. And of course, there's always an angle there, and that's why we all have to pull on the ear back and up when we examine, uh, examine the ear. So one trick that I have uh, used, uh, before is that I used to use the shaft of the endoscope uh, to do this uh, alignment. And nowadays what I used to do, what I'm doing is that I use like a retaining stitch and this is what I show you. I just put, a, put the stitch just uh, a two or micro just beyond the, the kink and put it from behind uh, the ear. So you can see here with the, uh, the stitch and then pull on it so you straighten the ear canal. I find this to be very useful. The other thing, other trick that I want to tell you about is that, you know, when you're doing endoscopic ear surgery, you don't just think visualization, think of what you're going to do after the visualization. So you need to really enlarge the canal to accommodate the scope and to accommodate your, your instrument. So really you try to visualize the whole uh, fibers and, and annulus. And you need to create a space for the endoscope. So using an angled endoscope, uh, you really uh, need to create a space for it. And if you're looking at the vector tympanum, um, you want to be at the um, anterior part of the uh, of the ear canal. This is sort of the field of, of the light of the endoscope, the angled endoscope. Um, so it's always tissue. Uh, uh, a tissue uh, instrument endoscope are very similar to other uses of the endoscope. So try to enlarge the canal in theory. Uh, if you want to work at the attic, it's counterintuitive to, to think that you need the space here, but you need to have a space here to uh, to get into the uh, uh, to have a space for the endoscope. Um, in general, again, I think the uh, the endoscopic ear surgery. Uh, 
of the use of the endoscope uh, refocuses our attention on ventilation. It allows us to gain access into the isthmus. And I think it allows us to rethink the role of the mascot uh, in chronic ear surgery. And uh, I think, again, if we can improve the outcomes in chronic ear surgery, uh, we cannot keep hitting the same nail with the same hammer. We need to try a different hammer. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to participate um, uh, in this uh, panel.